Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you for joining us today. Today you get to travel with us to a place you might know from your Monopoly game. We're heading to Reading, Pennsylvania. It's the birthplace of the Reading Railroad. It also hosts many different things, such as the Reading Phillies, which is a minor league baseball team. They have about 92,000 residents, but the most important thing for today is they host the Reading Area Fire Museum. And this is where we're headed. Let's go take a look. You're Bill? I'm Bill. Good nice morning. Nice to meet you, Bill. Thanks for inviting us out. Welcome to the Reading Area Firefighters Museum. Yeah, it's awesome. Driving up here, we're right in the middle of the city, it feels like. Well, you are. This was the original, one of the original areas of the city that was first developed. This is the first ward. So everything grew up around the Schuylkill River and the riverfront. Yeah, the outside of the building looks absolutely awesome. How old is the building? This building, the first two floors were built in 1876. Wow, wow, a lot of history here. There certainly is, and we hope that you'll enjoy seeing it. Now, you do specialized tours on a regular basis, right? When do you operate? Well, we normally operate on Thursdays from 9 to 12, because we're also here in our work detail, so we're open to the public. And then every Saturday from 10 to 2, okay. we're open. Okay, can anybody just stop in, or do they need to make an appointment? No, you can just stop in uh, during those hours, we do special tours by arrangement by appointment. Okay, special tours, so like if I had a field trip for a school mm -hmm. or a Eagle Scout group that I want to come see, that would be a specialized We're tour. We're part of a bus tour group too out of uh, this area of Pennsylvania, so we do have some bus tours that come. Okay, this is your show. You do a lot of tours, so we're just gonna kind of follow along and learn as much as I possibly can about the fire service. Okay, well, as we go around this room, the theme is we take you from the early days of firefighting in colonial days when buckets were the only firefighting tool, two gallon leather buckets that you threw water on the fire with. And as we go around the room, we go from buckets to hand-drawn, hand-pumped, horse-drawn, steam-pumped, and finally motorized fire apparatus. Wow, that's all in this room, all in this building. Right here on this first floor. Well, all right, let's, let's take a look. Okay. Some of these apparatus are on loan. Some of the other apparatus are actually from Reading. But this is a, an original hand pumper that was uh, actually at the Robizonia Furnace. It was more of a, an industrial apparatus, which is why it's small. This is a hand pumped apparatus. This is a regular size hand pumped apparatus. <laughs> okay. This originally was from the city of Philadelphia. Okay. Ended up in Wimmelsdorf which is a borough west of here. Okay. So here you have the smaller hand pumper, the larger hand pumper, and then we go from there to steam pump and so forth. Okay. The leather bucket, this is, can I touch? Oh, you certainly can. <laughs> so this is just one of the leather buckets that they used back in the day. From what I understood, make sure I'm correct, that they would actually label these with their names of the people that would come yes. in. We have a bucket that's currently out for restoration that has the name of the person who was a member of the first fire company here in Reading, which goes back to 1771. Wow. But that's being restored right now. Right. But this is a typical leather bucket, and the ordinance in Reading said that when the cry of fire went out, you were either to take your buckets, you were supposed to have two in a household, you're either supposed to take them to the fire or put them out in your stoop where other people could collect them. Okay. After the fire, they were all thrown on a pile, and that's why your name needed to be on it, so that you could <laughs> retrieve your bucket. Right. The bucket was used at first to throw water on the fire. Later on, it was used to fill these tubs, okay. these pumpers, with water, so that as people pumped, the water supply uh, forced the... Uh, okay, so this would be filled with water inside here, and this hand pump, you're basically pumping up and down to get a spout to come out there? Yep. Okay. Yep. How, 
Again, how this far is a does that version. shoot? I mean, it's a smaller well, one. It depends how fast you could pump. Okay. <laughs> Uh, with with this particular engine, which is a uh, used in a city type environment, if you could pump 50 strokes a minute, you could throw a steam, stream of water as high as a three and a half or four story colonial building. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Because roof fires were very typical in those days because of wooden shingles, sparks from chimneys. So that was a typical uh, type of fire that you had to be able to reach with water. Okay. Before these hand pumpers, it was only as far as you could throw the water, <laughs> right. which wasn't very far. Right, right. And do you use hose carts back then to go complement with Well, them? as time went on and uh, water supplies were developed in cities like Reading in 1820, uh, where the hydrant system was first put in, they called them fire plugs back then, they were a little different setup, but you could hook up a hose to feed the trough of water instead of using the bucket. Okay. So the hose carriage was one of the first type. Now we're in the process of trying to uh, uh, acquire a hose wagon, which is more like an horse-drawn express wagon. Okay. And fire hoses packed in that just like it is on today's fire trucks. Okay. But uh, we haven't gotten that yet, but we're working on it. All right. And it's, uh, it's one from Reading too that we're trying to get back. So as we work our way around here, well, I yeah. noticed these pictures here. There are a ton of people on the pictures. How many volunteers were back in the day? Well, think of how many people you needed to fight a fire. First of all, you had to pull the apparatus by hand. Now on a day like today, that eh, wouldn't have been too bad, but a snowfall, blowing snow, thunderstorm, muddy streets, because they weren't paved, took a lot of people just to get the apparatus to the scene. Okay. Then you needed people to keep pumping. Well, pumping at 50 strokes a minute, very labor intensive. It's just like doing CPR. You know? Well, sure. And those, those particular apparatus required about 20 people okay. to pump at one time. So you had to have people there to relieve those who got exhausted, fell out, and then you replaced them. Okay. So. Yes, these fire companies had to have many members. Right. So many, at one time, the city of Reading's volunteer department had almost 10,000 members. Wow, wow, uh, that's uh, unheard of in today's <laughs> world. <laughs> well, fortunately, they didn't all show up at the same fire. That would have been chaotic. Right. Especially in later years <laughs> when you didn't need all those people to pump. Right. But yes, this is typical collage of company members. Uh, this happens to be the Rainbow Fire Company, which was is considered the oldest company in Reading. It was not the first. The first company was this Union Fire Company of 1771. And it was basically just a bucket brigade company. Okay. These display cabinets are from the other 14 companies that existed in the city of Reading over the years. Okay. The department grew to 14 companies and each of the cabinets has uh, three or four companies represented the names of the companies are on top of the cabinet and then the artifacts are various pictures, badges, trumpets. Uh, the trumpet is what uh, intrigues a lot of people. They say, well, what are they for? Well, they were the forerunner of the walkie-talkie. Okay. At a fire, of course, in the old days, there were no radios. And uh, to be heard for the officer or the chief to be heard above the din of the whole operation, he used these trumpets or a version of them. Now these are ornamental. Okay. And these are used today in parades. You'll see them being carried upside down with flowers in them. Okay. One enterprising fireman said, you know, if you put a cork in that end, this holds quite a bit of beer. <laughs> that's a typical beer, fireman beer, right there. Beer and firemen seem to go together. <laughs> they do, they do. So that's what all these artifacts are okay. in these cabinets. So most of the fire stations had horses too. So you had to maintain not just a building, but you had to take care of animals. From about 1874 or five on, the department started to use horses to pull the apparatus. Uh, and that was a result of the fact that in 1872, there was a, a large series of arson fires here in the city. And it pointed out two things, the delay in getting the alarm of fire out so people knew there was a fire and getting the apparatus to the fire. Okay. And so they started using horses. The horses used to live in this part of the building, the first stroke of the alarm system, 
They were trained to trot over to their respective apparatus, they knew which was theirs, and get underneath the hitch. The driver would simply pull one strap, the hitch and the harness would go on the horse, and they were ready to go. They could get out just as fast as they do today. <laughs> That's pretty slick. That's absolutely amazing to train animals like that and work like that. So let's take a look down the road here. And these are all the different fire companies throughout Reading, you were saying. Yes, just these are just the city of Reading. Now, we call this the Reading Area Firefighters Museum because we do also incorporate artifacts, pictures, and collectibles from some of the county fire companies, too. We want this to be a regional museum. Reading has the oldest history, and Reading has the most artifacts simply because of that. Okay. But we do incorporate the county companies here. Okay. So we've gone from man-pulled to horse-pulled. What's next after that? Well, this is man-pulled, and then this was adapted later on for horses. This is huge. To pull this to a scene? Yep. No and wonder this, it takes 20 this, guys. This served uh, the city of Philadelphia for a number of years. Okay. The American Fire Company, which is the name on it, which was founded in 1790. This apparatus dates to the early 1800s, made in Philadelphia. So this, this actually traveled over the cobblestone streets of Philadelphia at one time, and eventually it was sold to the Wommelsdorf Fire Company, which is a borough west of here. Okay, okay. The craftsmanship that these things are made of are absolutely amazing. To have a, a vehicle last that long, we don't even make vehicles like this anymore. I mean, the craftsmanship alone and the architecture and the, the ornateness of these things are phenomenal. Well, you'll see on the motorized apparatus, we still go in for the gold leafing and the artwork that goes on the trucks, even today's modern apparatus. Right. That's still a lost art, gold leafing. Right. And the murals that they put on the, on the side panels of the pump. It definitely gives you that pride and ownership of the fire department that you belong to. Yes, and there was a great deal of that. So much so that firemen sometimes fought at a fire over who was going to put the first water on the fire. <laughs> and the fire continued to burn while they did that. They... <laughs> What's this next thing here? Is well, this a chemical or is this a... This is what revolutionized the fire service. Hand pumping, of course, very labor intensive. Keeping the tub filled with water before it ran out of water was very labor intensive. But now we come to the steam engine. The steam engine was pulled by horses. Okay. It only took one driver, one person to drive them. And generally, he ended up being the boiler maker that operated the boiler. Okay, so this, this is a huge boiler. This is a water boiler that builds up steam. Okay. The steam is then used to force the water through hoses onto the fire, builds up pressure. You needed to develop about 30 pounds of pressure before you could start pumping water. So it took a little while from the time you left the firehouse and got to the fire before you had enough pressure to pump. So they did some innovations to help that along. This particular steamer, which is from the city of Reading, it's the last steamer in the city of Reading. The motorized truck that replaced it's on the other side of the wall, so we'll look at that next. Okay. But they used to keep the water in the boiler warm by hooking it up to a heater. Okay. And that's the pipe that feeds the heater that kept the water in the boiler warm. So they necessarily wouldn't have the fire burning the entire time, only when they got to the scene or when the fire call came out, right? Yes, the boiler, the boiler pit was usually kept filled with excelsior and wood. And as the, uh, the alarm was sounded, someone would light the fire before they pulled out. And some of the bigger cities, there was actually a striker mechanism underneath there, like a cigarette lighter that would light the excelsior as the apparatus went over it. Okay. So by the time you got to the fire, you had enough pressure. It took about eight minutes. Okay. Take it up to 30 pounds. Okay. That's a typical response time nowadays. You know, five yeah. to eight minutes to a scene. That's a typical response time. Yeah. Now, if the fire was right around the corner, you had to wait. <laughs> but that's where a truck called the chemical wagons came in handy. Okay. Uh, we don't have one of those here, but the chemical wagon was like a big fire extinguisher on wheels. Soda acid fire extinguisher. And you simply inverted the uh, tank, mixed the... Uh, acid with the bicarbonate of soda, and that created a reaction that propelled that salt solution onto the fire. Right, right. And that would hold you over until you were able to build up enough steam okay. to operate. Man, this thing is absolutely huge too. About, do you know what this would weigh? For uh, We had it weighed, I think it was about 6,000 pounds, about three tons. <laughs> this is a bigger size. Right. 
yeah, if you guys are watching this and you like this history, definitely come see these guys. Come down here and take a look at this. I try to catch it on camera and we, you know, we're talking about it, but being here and you can, the smell of it and stuff like that, it brings you back to that time. It just, it makes me excited. It gives me goosebumps just talking about it. So what do you have else going around here? Well, as I said, we're a regional museum and we wanted to incorporate the county. This is uh, what we refer to as our county cabinet. Uh, this is a picture of every county fire company that existed back in the 1930s. There was a photographer named Anderson uh, who went around and took pictures of every single fire station that existed at the time. And those are badges and various things from those companies. We also have a lot of these what we call yard longs. They're three foot long photographs of firemen gathered as a group to go on an excursion or a tour. Many of the fire companies had their sister or brother companies in other cities. Okay. So they would uh, hire a train, hire, they had a band, they would get on and go on a week-long excursion, or they would go on a trip to Gettysburg or various other places as a group, and they would line up before they would leave uh, for a group picture. That is awesome. So it's almost were, like they're, they're in their Class A uniforms. They get their gloves on, their hats. That's their parade uniforms. Yeah, yeah. And as you go up the stairway later on to the second floor, the whole stairway is a bunch of these yard longs from the various fire companies here in Reading. What else we have over here? Well, uh, this is our scuba cabinet. As I said, the scuba team used to, to occupy this building, uh, underwater rescue team. But since then, the county now has grown to the point where they do underwater recovery and rescue. And so the city's team, which existed since the 1960s, wasn't really needed anymore, so they disbanded. Okay. But these are artifacts from the scuba team that used to occupy this building. Okay. Let's see what, you've got a big house here. Let's keep okay. moving along. Okay, well, the big thing here in Reading was the, uh, uh, the Implication, implementation of the Gamewell fire alarm system. This cabinet kind of shows you some of the equipment that goes with the system. Uh, an article that shows you what City Hall, the fire alarm headquarters used to look like after the system was put in place. Those arson fires that I spoke about in 1872 pointed out two things. The difficulty in pulling apparatus to the scene by hand mm -hmm. and the time it took to raise the fact that there was a fire, especially at night. What you had to do was either ride to the county courthouse in the center of Reading, okay. tell the sexton on duty that there was a fire and where the fire was, what ward it was. He would climb the bell tower and manually strike the bell the number of times equal to the ward. So if the fire was in the fourth ward, he'd keep ringing the bell four times. Okay. Until he heard people starting to yell fire and he could tell that people were aware there was a fire. By that time, he didn't have to look hard. You could usually see the fire. And by the time they got there, pulling apparatus by hand, setting up a bucket supply or hooking up to a water supply, most of the places burned down. You focused on saving the surrounding buildings. Right. In 1873, the city decided, okay, there's a system called the Gamewell Fire Alarm System that's been established, actually started up in Boston, spread to some of the bigger cities. It was a way of using the telegraph system okay. to tell you where there was a fire. And they did that by simply putting a fire alarm box like okay. this on, on a street corner and giving it a certain number. Inside, as a code wheel went around, it would have notches on it that corresponded to the number. So inside that box was a code wheel that had one notch, a space, two notches, a space, four notches. Okay. Each time that notch would touch a contact or break the circuit, it would ring a bell in the firehouse or punch a hole in the tape. Okay. And so we have an operating system if you want to pull the alarm box. Absolutely. Go right ahead. This is the way. So go right ahead. Fire's going on. I would come here, it says pull handle. And then just pull the lever, right? Pull it down, let it go. And this is what would register in the firehouse. One, two, four. You looked on the chart and one, two, four is it's at fourth, fourth and spruce. spruce. Fourth and spruce is up two blocks and down a block. So all of these boxes 
were, were alarms that this company responded to. Okay. So it on would, the tape it would, here. It would register four times, and that was just to make sure the number was correct each time. So here's the one, here's the two, here's the four. That's it. Okay. Now we hooked up a smaller bell because that's the one that would normally ring. <laughs> okay. Okay, that'd be a little much <laughs> for tours. So that would ring when there was an actual fire. But this is the way the system operated. And these are all on corners throughout the, the whole city of Reading. All of these up to where it says second alarm engine five would be alarm boxes that this company would have responded to. Okay. On second alarm, it would have been those boxes. This is absolutely amazing. It, the clockwork that's done inside of that to put the system together, but the simplicity of just using sound. They're almost like our daily pagers now. We get those tones. Yep. This is the first tone of a bell that gives us the signal of where we need to go or what service needs to go when out. When I first started the apartment in 59, the first thing that came in when there was an alarm box, the lights went on and that bell started to ring. Yep. At two o'clock in the morning, that got your attention. <laughs> so behind us is the next thing that we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna talk about this later, right? This well, is the. We'll talk about this right now because it follows what we just saw. The last steamer in the city was in service from 1909 to 1923, drawn by horses. This is the motorized fire truck that replaced the steamer back in 1923. Wow. The other two apparatus that we have here we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, they are special restorations. They are former Reading apparatus that have been restored and we've got them back here and ready. Okay. And we'll talk about those after you look at two other rooms. Okay. Three other rooms here in the building. Okay. Now, I love the fact that you put a label on these. So anybody that's walking around, one of the things our viewers like to know is what kind of pump is it and what, how many gallons does it pump? And it says it right here for you. Yep. So, all right, let's okay. uh, take a look upstairs. I guess the next place we're gonna go? Sure. All right. So we'll come back and see the engine bay in just a little while. We'll take a look at these trucks in detail. And we're taking, where are we going next, Chief? Okay, I'm gonna send you up and meet our curator, John Trimble, who's gonna show you the uh, second floor of this very ornate building. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe we'll catch up to you when we come back down. Okay, and we'll look at these other apparatus. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. Okay. So heading upstairs here. I love the woodwork in this building. One of the things I noticed is the construction of the building itself is, you know, takes you back in time. The banister is that hardwood built real sturdy. These stairs are how many hundred years old and they feel so sturdy. You don't, you got a lot of creaks, but man, this is absolutely awesome. Hello. Hello. You are John? Yes. Nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting us in. You're welcome. Oh. So, wow, look at this room. I was not expecting the large room yeah. on a second floor. Right. How tall are these ceilings? Uh, about 18 feet. Wow. Uh, this was the meeting room of the company. This is where the company uh, did their business, um, held their meetings. So look at the desk. Man, this is an awesome. It almost <coughs> looks like the president's resolute yes. desk that you see in National yeah. Treasure. This is, it's all one piece. It's a six position desk. Uh, we believe it was made here in Reading. And, and is this pretty much the board members that would be yes. at this table? Uh, the front would be the president, uh, foreman and I believe vice president okay and the lower officers uh, treasurer secretary recording secretary uh, would be at the desk right so on the board here what are, are these all the old original board members or the, what the fire company would do they would hold a lottery every year or every other year because uh, they had so many members uh, they would hold the lottery um, if your name was drawn uh, they would uh, have your photograph taken and your picture would be on display. Right, right. Very formal. It looks like, you know, everyone has a suit, you know, yes. hair is clean cut, mustache is the handlebar mustache or the beards. So, and these downstairs, we were talking to the president and he said that at the beginning of this, there was over 10,000 members. Yes. So uh, between the 14 stations, um, there was um, a large amount of volunteers and the fire company was the social hub of the community at the time. Right, right. And look at the furniture that you have yes. here. I mean, just the chair. It almost looks like a king's chair. Yes. 
Uh, it's got the gavel and everything. This is absolutely amazing. So has this building been maintained this well this whole time or did yes. you do a renovation? Um, the re we did a renovation of this room in 2018. Um, just uh, just needed a cleaning and a spruced up. I mean, look at this library. This is a tip. Again, this is something that I've never seen. We've been to a couple different um, smaller museums. We've been up to New Hope. We've been uh, Keystone Valley. No, not Keystone Valley, uh, Twin Valley. Mm -hmm. They have a little museum um, with some of their stuff, but this takes the cake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for anything that it, I've it's, seen. It's a hidden gem yeah. in the city. You know, I had no idea. I've lived here for you know 28 years and had no idea this was even here. So if I were to want to come here, do I need to, to make an appointment? No, nope. um, you can uh, show up on Thursdays uh, 9 to 2 or 9 to 12 and uh, Saturdays 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay, and where are you ex exactly located? Uh, we are at 501 South 5th Street uh, in Riding, Pennsylvania and um, right at the corner of 5th and Laurel. Okay, do you have any kind of media presence for people to see like on uh, Facebook? Yes, or we, we are on Facebook and we do have a website. And what would those be? Um, you remember? The website is Reading Area Firefighters Museum dot com. It's okay. a little long, but <laughs> and um, same thing with the Facebook page. All right. So if you guys are watching, and you want to see it, then just a little bit to maybe schedule a trip here or come on vacation. I suggest you do that. Uh, before we continue to move on, do us a favor: hit subscribe, hit notification, so we can keep bringing you these uh, videos. We have a bunch of more rooms to hit. We're going to keep talking to John, and uh, he's going to show us some of the architecture and uh, about this building. So where are we us going from here? Okay, the next room we're going to go to, uh, we refer to it as the Wanamaker room, but it was the ladies parlor uh, where the ladies of the fire company would entertain their guests. Okay. So Wanamaker's, that's a big, um, almost department store stuff, yes. right? Uh, the, we call it the Wanamaker room is because the furniture in this room was furnished by John Wanamaker. Uh, the fireplace, the couches, the tables and chairs were donated to the Liberty Fire Company um, at the end of the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876. Uh, this furniture was on display at the Expo. Wow, wow. Again, this room is another 18 foot ceilings, big curtains. It definitely feels like that old time parlor, you know, got the carpet on the floor with the ornate designs, piano in the middle of the room. Do you mind if I take a look around? Yeah, just, help yourself. Yeah, these are the horns the president was talking about. Yes. Uh, and they, Remind me, make sure I got it right. These horns are used to basically control the scene. Originally, um, in the early days of firefighting, they, the, they would use them as a megaphone to shout the orders. Um, but it became more of a ceremonial um, presentation gift exchange between companies and... Okay. Uh, okay. And these are all different companies? That, they're all Most of fives. these are all um, Liberty or Reading City. Uh, trumpets. Uh, they were won at fairs and contests and um, gifts from, we have one from the Lady Friends of the Liberty to okay. Okay. members. Look at this fireplace. Look at the woodwork. I'm assuming this is all handmade. Yes, it's all uh, <laughs> Canadian maple. Absolutely beautiful. And it goes way up. Was this an active fireplace at one point? I believe it was gas fired at one time and the statues that are here. I have a clock similar to this at my house. Uh, I've never actually seen it in a museum before. I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, those kind of things are still in existence. So as I'm making my way to the other side of the room here, I noticed you got a lot of silver. Yes. Um, the fire companies would travel to other fire companies and the fire companies would host them, uh, lodge them, entertain them, feed them um, on their trips. Um, in exchange that, the fire company would take a gift um, as a thank you. Um, these are just some of the gifts that we, the Liberty Fire Company uh, has received from other fire companies. Uh, okay. For example, uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, they gave up a uh, silver plated uh, punch bowl. We have the sterling silver sculpture of a yacht at Atlantic City okay. from the Atlantic City Fire Department. So downstairs, I think the president did mention, you know, we saw the, um, the yardstick of, of people that were yes. um, going on parades and, and going on. Those are the people that would travel to different cities or different fire companies, right. stay with them for a little bit. 
Nowadays, we would give challenge coins or patches Correct. or something like that. Back in the day, they gave things like this. Right. Yeah, they, they would take a collection up between their members and um, purchase a gift. Um, we have a trumpet over here, sterling silver. They took a collection of silver coins from all the members, took the coins to a jeweler, and had a trumpet melted out of the coins. Wow, wow, that's absolutely amazing. So the firehouses being the hub of the communities back in the day, um, they hung out here too. Yes. Where would that be done? Is that in this room? This or? is this, like, again, this was the ladies parlor, the reading room. The men, um, the room directly below us was the smoking room. Okay. And um, that's where the men hung out. At. Okay, so we'll go see that. Yes. And what about if I wanted to bring my family and play games or anything like that? Uh, that would be the third floor, which was uh, added by the members in 1895. Uh, and it was mainly put on for recreation, uh, pool tables, uh, shuffleboard, um, card tables. Okay, okay. So yeah, it really becomes a community center, almost like the, the original YMCA, yes. where people would kind of hang out and play Correct. games and, and be part of that. But when you're here, if a fire alarm goes out, they're able to help the community yes. and actually go fight those fires. All right, we have another floor, right? Yes, the third floor. Um, it's currently not open to the public viewing um, due to fire codes. Okay. But we'll take a quick look and show you what hopefully future plans will be able to open up. Okay. So future plans, meaning you, you're trying to raise finance, right? Yes. Uh, we're, we're in the beginning stages of a capital improvement um, fund uh, to raise money for uh, ADA staircase or elevator okay. and uh, second means of egress with a stair tower. Okay. Okay. So if you guys are watching this and you like this, and this is something that you guys uh, want to see more of, you know, as we travel the country or you're here in Reading in Pennsylvania and you want to contribute, hit them up on their website, hit them up on their Facebook page. Uh, they love your donations, whether that, you know, a GoFundMe page or whatever, you know, help these guys out, help them get to the point where they can use the building to the fullest extent. <laughs> But we have an opportunity because, you know, we're filming. We want to show that we can go up yes. there. It's just not open to the public. Correct. All right, let's go take a look. I'll follow you. So this, is, this was the third floor. Uh, this side was the billiard side. Okay. And this is where... Oh, check this out. So this is the game room. Yes. So <laughs> walking around here, you got your pool tables all set up. Around the outside, you got card tables, checkers, Piano, play a little yes. bit of music. And you got cases here too. So what yes. do you got in the cases? Um, this is the for the uh, different SCBA breathing apparatus over the years. Okay. On how they advanced. So yes. they went from basically filters <laughs> to canisters in the, or cylinders, you know. Some people call them cylinders, yep. some people call them bottles, uh, depending on where you're at in the country. <laughs> and uh, the different style masks, the two-eyed masks. This would be very hard to work out yes. of. <laughs> compared to what we have today. What's up here? You got a mini hose yeah. cart? Yes, the hose cart was uh, made by a fireman of New York City. Uh, his name was Albert Kruder. Uh, he was so impressed with his trip to Reading um, that over the winter, uh, he made the model of the hose carriage and the ladder truck behind you. Okay. And presented them as gifts to the firemen of Reading. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. That. I would put my three-year-old in it and, and let him yeah. kind of play with it. Yeah, they were originally uh, designed for the kids at the fire company to pool in parades. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely a good way to keep the family involved yes. in it. And as we work our way around here, I noticed up top you have a lot of the old uniforms. Yes. And you have a traditional patch wall. Correct. This is what we have, I've seen a lot of nowadays. Um, is this one of your members that does this? Yeah, one of our members uh, started uh, just to, um, we had a large bag of patches and he just started putting them out uh, for display. Okay. Can people donate their patches? Yes, if they, if they come in for a visit, um, drop the patch off, we'll put it up on the board. Okay. Look at the uniforms they had back in the day. <coughs> so this is not necessarily a firefighting uniform. Correct, this, this was is... a parade uniform. Okay, okay. So you're, we would consider that what, a class A uniform yes. for a funeral or a parade Correct. or anything like that. And in here, these are more empty because everything's downstairs. Correct. But you got a lot of pictures still up here too. Yes. Yeah, we only have so much wall space. <laughs> right. Obviously, here's a pole. Yes, uh, this fire station never had a pole but um, the pole came out of one of the other city fire companies and we have it here just for the kids because they always ask, where's the pole? 
<laughs> right, right. Ma'am, that'd be a long drop down to the... Yes, <laughs> yeah, that would be. We're, we're 18 feet from the second floor, 18... Yeah, yeah, I would not go down it. <laughs> so this is what, what an old bunk? Yes, this How? The bunk came out of the Marion Station uh, here in Reading. Uh, you know, again, this is just to uh, represent what, uh, how the firemen lived in the station. Okay, okay. And behind us are a lot more of these parade pieces, right? Yes. This, is, this is what you were talking about as far as the meter pictures. Look at all the people you have. I mean, that's like an entire city fire department yeah. of Philadelphia. It, now, it nowadays. wasn't uncommon for 50, 75 firemen to go on these trips. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And when they would go on these trips, they would take a band with them and, and all the auxiliary equipment and everything to... Do you think we'll ever get back to that? Probably not. <laughs> As we go around here, ladies' <coughs> uniform. This is this would from the Hamden's Fire Company's ladies' auxiliary, uh, more modern, 1950s, 60s. Okay, okay. Looks like you're setting up a dispatch station back yeah, here. Yeah, this was uh, the watch desk uh, alarm room uh, display at one point. Okay. Move some of the stuff down. Downstairs, we saw where the ticker is, so this is <coughs> kind of the same thing. Same thing. This was uh, the bell striker. When the alarm would come in, it would run through this, and it would actually. The bell strikers needed to be a slower than this. Okay. So it was a way to drive. It would slow the paper down. As it punched through, it would trigger the circuit for that and activate the bell strike. Okay. And then instead of the big board, maybe you had a dispatcher that read through and then... Yeah, through that, or each of the stations had smaller boards also. Okay. Okay. Very cool. So there's a couple more things downstairs that we missed that we want to go back to. Okay. Yeah. We got that other room, and then we also have a couple of your fire trucks. Yes. I'm very interested in taking okay. a look at those. Okay, let's go. All right. <coughs> We're back again. All right, so <laughs> this is right below the women's parlor. Yeah, the best room. The best room. Maker room. Okay, and what we have in here? Well, this, as John said, was the the parlor where most of the time the drivers and the firefighters congregated. We've turned this into a display area also with a number of cabinets, artifacts from different companies and different facets of the fire department. Uh, this is our EMS cabinet. Uh, Reading had the first paramedics in southeast Pennsylvania starting in 1974, 75. Okay. Somewhere thereabouts. In fact, one of our first paramedics in the department is one of our docents here at the fire museum also. Right. His name right. is Mike Long and he's featured in this news, in this magazine article. Okay. He's the guy in the upper left. So he's one of our people here. So I love the fact that you guys had the ability in this space to put up all these cabinets. They're very well lit with a lot of history in between them. Well, John's the guy who, uh, who arranged all this, so he deserves the credit for that. Uh, this, of course, is a cabinet for the Rainbow Fire Company, which is the oldest still existing fire company in Reading from 1773 on, and many of the artifacts are from the Rainbows. Right. This is a cabinet that has pictures of all of the horse-drawn apparatus in the city of Reading in 1896. Okay. That was 12 of the 14 companies. Now, the last two companies, the Union and the Oak Brook, weren't established yet. So in 1896, these were the 12 companies that were in service, and these are pictures of all of their horse-drawn apparatus. Um, Love the uh, old uniforms. You got the women's and the men's uniforms. Yes, and these are some artifacts from the fire service, the life gun. Um, a life gun? What I, is a life gun? Well, that would shoot a rope, and they would use that down here at the river. Okay. You could shoot a lifeline to somebody. Um, it was used during Agnes in, in 1972 up and outside of Reading where there was an attempted rescue made. I, otherwise, I've never seen it used, okay. but we had two of them. And they were adapted from old Civil War, pre-Civil War era rifles. Yeah, that's awesome. The first type of breathing apparatus that we had in the department, the Chemox filter mask. Right. When I started in the department in 59, that was what we used. So you actually were able to use one of those masks? I used one of these. The problem with them was they were only designed to filter out carbon monoxide and, and change it to carbon dioxide. Okay. But any exotic fumes, it didn't necessarily work. Okay. The, the uh, element that was in there was called hopcolite, and that's what converted the CO to CO2. Okay. 
but uh, yes, I use those. With the double-sided glass rather than a single face piece, was it hard to see out of? No, um, amazingly, they were big enough that you, you could see out of them. Yep. I mean, the, the air packs uh, that came along with the wider vision face piece were much better. Right. But in the very beginning, that was the best we had. Thank you for your service for bringing us through that. <laughs> <laughs> we lost a firefighter in Reading in 1985 at the YMCA. Okay. In downtown Reading. His name was Donald Jacobs. Uh, Ironically, his father was a Philadelphia firefighter lieutenant, uh, but he lived up here in Reading. And at one point he had lived in the YMCA, so he was pretty familiar with the place, and I think it made him a little complacent. Mm. Uh, what happened was an arsonist started a fire in the basement. It finally got to the first floor. He was in the process of rescuing uh, three tenants, bringing two of them down the inside stairway. Fire flashed through the lobby and were up the stairway and caught him in the, and the occupants in the stairway. That was his air bottle. That was the ax he was carrying, what's left of them. Wow, wow. Hey. It's amazing what a flash over and the dangers that you actually go through as firemen. You know. Well, the bad thing was the, the watchman or the security guard who was on duty that night, that was his first night at the Y. Mm. And so he made the mistake of propping the door to the stairway, the fire door, open so firefighters had access because it was a uh, door you had to be buzzed in okay but the fact the door was open allowed the fire to come through the lobby and go right up the stairway uh, the sprinklers which were only from the fourth floor on up at that point the building was being retrofitted they operated and actually put the fire out after it got to that level okay but not the lobby oh. and the guard called the operator and when you dialed operator in reading at that time you got an operator it was either in Philadelphia or Scranton. And when he said he was at the YMCA, they thought he meant the Philadelphia YMCA. Mm. And they connected him to the Philadelphia Fire Department. And this conversation went back and forth for a couple of minutes till they realized it was not Philadelphia, it was Reading. Right. And what's this? This is our 9-11 display. That's a piece of the ironwork, the steel girder from the, uh, one of the Trade Center buildings. It's on loan to us from the Exeter Township Fire Department. Okay. But we have a video loop, loop that runs and uh, some artifacts from inside the World Trade Center. Right. What's this big thing behind you? That's an industrial type fire extinguisher. Um, it was donated to us by somebody. This was entirely corroded. It was green. Mm. And, so that's copper. And so our restoration specialist, a guy named uh, Ralph Baselli, he refinished this and uh, redid it. Beautiful. It was piece. used at a place called Reading Bone Fertilizer, which is right outside of Reading, and it's just a hand pulled cart with a big fire extinguisher on it. Okay. Okay. This is a helmet display. It's a collection of all of the helmets from the Reading Fire Department from each company. So, are these helmets that people actually wore? Yes. Mm -hmm. They look small. <laughs> Compared to the helmets we have, even our leather helmets we have, are... We have found that the uniforms here don't fit most of us. Yeah. People were very small and not very broad shouldered. Okay. Uh, I have trouble getting into some of these uniform coats that are here. I went through about 10 or 12 till I found one that I could get into. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just looking at this helmet compared to the helmet I just received. I got a new helmet for my station and it's almost twice the size of this yellow yeah, helmet here. Well, of course, these are the old style New Yorker style helmets. And the collection was owned by the fire chief who lived down in Elverson, down near uh, where John lives. And he had this display in his house. And he said, when I downsize, I'm going to give it to you. And he did. We're housing him in candy cabinets that came from a candy store on Penn Street, okay. Reading. They're matching cabinets. Okay. And made a great display cabinet. Yeah, it looks very nice. I like how they're all lit up. And so how do people... Um, how do you raise finance to do something like this? How do you, how do you sponsor this kind of, kind of well, ordeal? Well, we, we beg and borrow, we don't steal. <laughs> but uh, we are, we've been very fortunate to get donations from various people. Some of the fire companies have turned over some of their sinking fund monies, uh, which because they're no longer doing anything, they have this money sitting in the bank and they've donated some of it to us. Okay. Unfortunately, these are one time things so it's not a recurring income it's very difficult to try and build a budget 
because you're not sure what your income is going right, to be. Right. You know what some of the expenses are going to be, but you don't know what your income is. Do you charge for people to come into the museum? $5 for anybody 16 or over. Okay, that's cheap. Anybody under 16 is free. Yeah, that's for as much as you have here, I think you could raise the price. Well, John bit. has recommended that, <laughs> and some, some, uh, some of us have kind of resisted for different reasons, but I think... Uh, it's well worth it. it it's going to happen, and especially with inflation, I think people understand a little bit better. Right, the right. prices go up. So, we have a couple more things to see, and these are the apparatus of your place. you got two more engines, actually three engines. We'll go over those and kind of talk about those a little bit. Okay. All right? Sure. I'll follow you. Well, we'll go all the way over to this first one. Okay. Which I think we touched on before you went upstairs. This is the 1923 American LaFrance engine that replaced the last horse-drawn steamer in the city of Reading. Absolutely amazing. This truck served from 1923 to 1949. It went into private ownership. Uh, the man who owned it stayed here locally. Okay. And uh, eventually uh, his relative, after he died, sold it to us. Okay. It's a 750 gallon. It was, it was a, chemi a, a chemical combination because it did have chemical tanks on it. Okay. They were replaced. And that's just a fuel tank up there. Okay. And there was a booster tank installed that held a little bit of water, less than 100 gallons. So but, how does this operate? I mean, obviously it's an open cab. You got a huge light and bell. You ring that as you go down. But is there a pump panel? How do something yeah, the, like this? Yeah, the pump is right here on the, on the side. Uh, it's a very simple compared to apparatus today. Um, and you simply operated the pump. So it runs off the engine? Yes, this is a chain drive apparatus, by the way. Okay. But yes, it, uh, it's a rotary pump that uh, operated off the truck. Okay. And was able to pump 750 gallons, so which in those days was a fair amount of, of uh, water. It still is pretty good today. It's almost like a brush truck. Yeah. So, yeah. so these are the outlets, that would be an inlet? And intake, and you have that on the other side. Right, and, oh, Same there's thing. your gauges. Okay, I see yep. the gauges now. Yeah, a little bit laid out, a little bit different than the day's trucks. Right, and then you got like a booster reel up top. Booster reel, that was the chemical line. They made that into a water booster line. Okay. So, adapted does this, it. Does this one currently run? Uh, it's not roadworthy. Okay, not roadworthy, but no. it will start up and... It, it, it can be run and it will operate. Uh, however, at the moment, it, it's not roadworthy. We wouldn't take it out. Okay. Besides that, the steering is very difficult. <laughs> when you turn the steering wheel an inch, that's all the wheels turn. <laughs> no power steering on it, I no. see. No. So. And this one is absolutely gorgeous. This is the gem right now of, of all the apparatus. Okay. This engine sat right here. Okay. From 1931, when it was purchased, to 1966. It operated out of this building. Now, in later years, it had a windshield on it. But when it originally came from the factory, this is the way it came. The, it was sold in 19, after 1966. The owner had it completely restored off the frame, which means you take everything off down to the bare frame. Yeah, I mean, even the nuts and bolts are all... Everything is either refinished, uh, re, re, you know, redone, or replaced. Okay. In the case, the, uh, as the need requires. So the same kind of pump, pumps basically in the middle. This is a thousand gallon pump. Wow, in, okay. Which, there was only 13 of these made in 1931. Okay. Most engines were less than a thousand gallon. But right. This was a thousand gallon engine. Uh, one of the drivers of this truck still lives across the street from the station. Okay. Remember the Liberty Fire Company, President of Liberties, and he was a paid fireman until he retired. Okay. So again, just kind of like the other pump, you got your inlet, your outlets. Is this the PTO? How are you switching yes, it over? Yes, you switch from road to pump. Okay. So this is pretty much your pump panel of today's engines. Yep. So you got your gauges to know what kind of pressure you're putting out. You got your pump right in the middle, your PTO. Very simple, but yet effective. It's amazing when you lift the hoods on some of these trucks and, and look at today's apparatus, how simple 
these were and how complicated the others are. Right. Some of them run on computers. When the computer doesn't work, it's like any computer, <laughs> either does a truck. Right, right. Well, how much hose would you carry in the back of this? Well, they could carry on this particular truck, maybe a thousand feet or more. Okay. Or two and a half. Um, some of the hose beds were racked with two and a half and inch and a half split. Okay. Uh, it depended on the layout of the truck and how the, the company operated and the type of neighborhood it operated in. Okay. Now one thing I've noticed, and even just between the two trucks, is all the gold leaf in the painting. Is this all hand done stuff? Or yes, is yes. That's, that's still an art form that there aren't many people who do it, but you'll see it on this truck. Now this, this engine was just repainted by the Penske Corporation and we had a fellow who came in and did uh, the gold leafing okay. on the back portions of the truck, right. which were the areas that were painted by Penske. Okay. okay. Uh, this is a 1937 Peter Persh engine. Uh, it was only a 500 gallon pumper and this served at the Rainbows. When I started in the department in 1959, before I was married, I used to stay at the Rainbows because they were a little short on manpower because they were a downtown company. So I rode on this truck. Okay. And over the years in the, in the past, I've driven this truck. Okay. Too. So, so these two are roadworthy. I want to thank you so much for inviting us out. This was an excellent uh, learning opportunity for myself. My pleasure. So a beautiful place you have here, and I'm definitely going to bring my grandkids and kids back here uh, to take a look at it. Good. Come and see it. Once again, this is Heroes Next Door. This was the Reading Area Fire Museum. If you're ever in the area, do us a favor. Stop by. Take a look at this stuff. There's a lot of learning to do. We appreciate it. Do us a favor. Hit subscribe, hit notification, and the like button. One more thing, share these videos. It helps us build and we can keep helping out. See you again next week.